consulting firm, private equity firm called the Exit Group of Companies, and uh, this is my first time in Salt Lake City, and I'm, I'm a bit jealous uh, of the scenery around here. Um, yeah, I didn't know you all were going to be on Twitter, so I, I threw my stuff up there. Um, so, hopefully uh, I've done a good job of condensing about 15,000 words into about 15 minutes. Uh, so I'll do my best to kind of um, run through things. Funny slides. Uh, so in this era, uh, human ambitions will yield uh, inevitable technological ambiguities uh, in the realm of ethics and even the very classifications that our species has understood itself as being for the past 200,000 years or so. Um, in the present, uh, we will be challenged to become as agile in our ideas on humanity as the multitude of innovators uh, will be in inventing the future. Um, I'm sure you all are familiar with these movies. They just briefly peer into kind of what society's fears are of how technology will affect us in the near or uh, far future. Um, all of them suggest uh, technological catastrophes uh, and they accompany our very poor social uh, interaction um, as we have it today. So I'm an engineer and an economics nerd uh, to sum it all up and you know, have some degrees in, in those fields. And my objective is usually to root cause problems and how they exist and try to figure out what incentivizes those problems, whether they're political, uh, economic, sociocultural, or technological problems. Um, so basically my greatest fear and the, and the reason that I write uh, right now and published a book this past uh, July <laughs> is that you know, in my generation, I was, I'm a millennial, I was born in 1981, uh, sometime during my life that we have the potential to lose our technological abilities, our technological extensions as a direct result of our uh, failure to produce some uh, reasonable social interaction. And uh, these slides are, you know, test tube uh, inceptions and, you know, war as, as we've known it, a, a war depiction. And uh, basically, uh, over the past 200,000 years or so, uh, spirituality has dominated the human consci consciousness, including the identity of a wide array of immaterial theologies, ideologies, uh, and mythologies. And humans' ability to compensate for the unidentifiable and unknown over the millennia have provided some extraordinary philosophical uh, exploration. I'm always you know, impressed in reading back to see what people were thinking about hundreds and, and thousands of years ago. But the way I would kind of sum up spirituality is uh, as compensating for our inability to understand uh, how we function in the post-human uh, genome era. Uh, but now we're getting a little bit better. Uh, so I sum all this up to say um, that spirituality uh, in its relative state, you know, as some of you may be Mormons and others may be Muslim or Christian or have their particular uh, spiritual, oh, someone's on Skype. Uh, <laughs> Uh, their, their different uh, spiritual belief systems, uh, they all tend to be relative uh, based on uh, the current economic state. So it all involves, uh, well, it's all due to the relative scarcity, you know, where we live, how we live, and, and what we have access to. Uh, so again, I'm a business guy, and value proposition is uh, more of an MBA's term than a philosophical term or anything having to do with transhumanism. But uh, in looking at spirituality uh, and trying to explore it uh, on my own, as I used to be uh, a participant in the, the Christian church uh, in the United Church of Christ, and 
I try to figure out what is the core value proposition of spirituality. And I figure, you know, it's ultimately to make connections between physical beings and kind of compensate for the lack of connections that we can identify by the naked eye. You know, I may be brown, you all may, well, all not be brown in this room. And, you know, male, female, you know, people have different uh, geographical and, and other differences that are uh, identified. And, you know, so spirituality's core value proposition is to make interhuman connections and, and superhuman uh, connections to some greater being to try and figure out uh, the meaning of life, or why we're here, and, and uh, how we can afford to get along better. Um, so, you know, my next question to myself in this exploration was, you know, can the value proposition be uh, achieved? And, you know, per the modern uh, understanding of uh, philosophical definitions uh, you know, on, on spirits and, and how they exist, uh, spirits are only stakeholders uh, in a singular physical being, uh, even as there are theologies that identify a uh, supreme spirit, um, the physical being's understanding of its individual spirit's interaction with itself is what molds socio-political interaction. So again, I'm sh just addressing uh, the incentives, uh, and dis or rather disincentives, that we have to, to interact well. Um, so there's already. Oh. A physical being's understanding uh, of its spirit existence incentivizes its individualistic uh, sentiment, um, which in turn incentivizes all sorts of uh, spin out um, realities like elitism and uh, protectionism and things of, of that sort. So these, these sentiments, as we feel that we are, you know, elites. Um, or have created some property or have entitlements to some property or ownership of some property, uh, whether it be intellectual property or land or uh, anything in, in those circles, um, we do have incentives to react uh, violently towards each other. And I think it sort of stems from our spiritual understanding uh, of ourselves. Uh, this is a, a really quick incentive model that I put together uh, based on our economic realities and uh, our understanding of uh, our spiritual being. So the S obviously represents the spirit and um, a spiritual being or force, and uh, the P represents a physical being. And up top you have uh, the spiritual and physical being interacting uh, over some scarce resources, and I have uh, desperation over in the left-hand corner. Um, some of the uh, adverse <laughs> situations that you know that we read about in the news today are all a, really a result of um, scarce resources. You know, multiple entities fighting over very scarce resources. So if you have a consumer in, say, Dubai buying fruit and uh, they're consuming uh, competitor in Duba. Very similar name, very different place in the northwestern part of um, Saudi Arabia. Uh, because the people of Dubai can afford to buy their goods at such a high premium, they kind of outcast the consumers uh, in Duba and create a direct uh, sociocultural rift, uh, at which point these spiritual beings uh, they find all kinds of incentives to uh, validate their, what, we, what we're calling terrorism here in the United States today, but to validate their aggression towards this uh, more powerful consumer. And then when you go to the, to the bottom of the slide and consider even a situation where um, resources are abundant, um, there is still, per spiritual understanding, some incentives for the physical beings to interact aggressively to procure uh, the majority of abundant resources because of their sense of potential sense of entitlement based on uh, their spiritual understandings of themselves. So I believe that 
uh, acknowledgement of spirituality and its direct connection to either some divine being or outside force manipulating our ability to perform well amongst each other uh, can create and does create a sense of entitlement, a sense of elitism, and ultimately a sense of protectionism, which is where you get uh, violent interaction between uh, physical counterparts, human beings. Um, so you know, it's necessary to understand uh, where these disincentives stem from. And I think the last uh, presenter kind of hit on this well. I call it, uh, in a new book I'm working on, the, the known division. So as we understand ourselves, maybe not necessarily the people in this room, but as the majority of the human population understands themselves, they are distinctly different from everyone else. And you know, you even see it in something as simple as road rage. People get pissed off, excuse my French, and feel <laughs> entitled to the road as it is and need you to get out of the way. Uh, and so you see all kinds of aggressive actions that, that come about. Uh, and uh, anyway, because of this known division, we tend to uh, interact without any regard for our human counterparts uh, ability to exist well. And even our, as science has come about um, over the millennia, uh, even our understanding of um, ourselves at the most minute level has been as distinctly different interacting bodies to come together and create this, this whole. When uh, about 20 years or so ago, and as string theory has, has started to develop, uh, at least from a theoretical and mathematical uh, standpoint, we're starting to see, uh, and maybe sometime in the near future, we'll be able to have an you know, actual experiment that we can witness with our own eyes, uh, that we are potentially, or you know, as I understand it, we are, in, in fact, all directly connected with everything in existence, including each other. And uh, it kind of takes away from the, the ill incentives that were brought about from our individualistic being previously. Uh, so I'll get, I'm kind of speeding through this pretty fast. Maybe we'll have some time for some questions. Um, so how do we get better from here? Um, I'm not a believer, so I believe that it is necessary to get rid of the, oh, that's a bad line. I think I, I rewrote that. It's necessary to get rid of the, the ambiguities that come about through these relative understandings of morality. So depending on who you are and what your economic state is in reference to your competitors, um, your idea of morality can be totally different. Uh, I think the, the first speaker uh, even referenced uh, that morality had to do with becoming um, more, like, more like God, and that can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different people. Uh, so the idea of morality as it, as it stands today is a bit, uh, is a bit ambiguous uh, because of its relativity. And uh, so I don't think that it's productive for the human species to excuse me, to progress uh, in this century and beyond uh, regarding the good as, as a moral good. I think we should specifically be honoring our mortal uh, being. And uh, to be uh, more redundant, I think that it's necessary for us to figure out how to protect lives because they are what adds value. Um, our ability to explore things uh, philosophically, our ability to build things. Um, I think over the, the past 100, 200 years or so, you know, we've proven that through adequate education that individuals from vastly different backgrounds can come about to produce very significant technological uh, goods. Uh, and uh, having said that, um, here is the, the definition of uh, the philosophy that my, my book is titled on called Integrationalism. And it is the mortal stance, political philosophy, ideology, or social outlook that stresses the worth of the group 
uh, integration list promote the uh, exercise of the individual's goals and desires, you know, promote, you know, incentivizing them to explore well uh, while not acknowledging their group uh, dependence. Uh, integration lists acknowledge an infinite loop of external interference upon one's own interests and uses group designation to incentivize the individual to create value for the group through self-actualization and technological developments of sorts. Um, I just, I really think that this is, this is important because if you, if you go back to um, any spiritual doctrine or how we understand our, ourselves uh, as existing via spirituality, uh, we have the potential to shut out uh, some extraordinary technological and philosophical and political and sociocultural thought uh, inside of our what are we at, 6.8 billion uh, individuals existing currently. With that said, that is my best shot to sum up half of another book project. That's it.